bind or to be bound, and to loose or to set free, to release from a burden, or to seal. I would like for you to think of these terms not so much as a physical release, but I'd like for you to use, if you would, a judicial uh, thought in that direction, such as putting a binder on something. What does that term mean? mean? It means usually that you put up earnest money, if it happens to be a piece of property you're buying, to show that you're sincere, that you're honest. Now, this is not going to be a tithing lecture, so <laughs> scratch that from your mind. I said, take in the terminology. You know I don't teach on tithing, so, so be it. A binder is something that binds. And I want you to think of this in a spiritual sense, especially in relationship to sealing because of Revelation chapter 7. Those that are sealed in their forehead. What's in your forehead? Your brain. He wants you to use it. No, get rid of this phony baloney stuff about marks. Okay, visible marks. It's not in the manuscripts. Not in the Greek, the Latin, or anything else. It is a binding thought. A thought that seals. And through the sealing if it happens to be sealed with God's truth, His Word, then that in turn brings eternal life. It is written in Romans, oh, chapter 8, say about verse 21. You all remember Romans 8. That's where it says some of you have a destiny and a purpose in life. There's more to God's Word than you've been taught. And you've known it since you were a child, that you were predestined chosen before the foundations of this earth age, that is to say, in the age that was. It states in that beautiful chapter in verse 21 that even the creation itself, that's the trees, the very land, the earth itself, groans to be released from this bondage or the binding. The binding of what? Satan's age. Man's flesh age where the earth itself, man pollutes it from, from one pole to the other. The earth itself groaning to get back to the natural order of things, where a perennial plant can be assured that with a new year it will have new growth, uh, and therefore eternal life, uh, if you follow me. You might remember in, what is it, Mark 11. The animals, um, in many cases it is written that in the millennium, the lion and the lamb will lie down together. In Mark, uh, I think it's 11, verses 2 or 3, somewhere along there, even the very sign that Jesus would be on entering Jerusalem at his first advent, not riding a white charger, but riding the white colt of an ass, what did he say? He said, go into the city, and when you see this coat, loose him. You must always have that loosing, if I may use that terminology, before you can serve Christ. Uh, the same as that coat had to be released uh, before he could serve Christ. So the animal kingdom itself waits for that loosening that being set free. And in a judicial sense, if you look at this, well, say from a legal aspect, to be freed uh, is to be innocent, set free. And so it is when you accept those responsibilities. Now, Jesus, uh, in his teachings, set certain parameters in and around this. Do you know what they are? Do you know what what rights you have as far as freeing someone, as far as loosing someone, or to bind someone. Satan certainly knows the parameters that he has as far as binding someone. Of course, he would have never bound any of you. You've never had any problems, have you? Never a moment's 
all of us he gets to if we're not careful. All those negative days where everything just goes wrong. You're bound. You're not free. You can't even think straight at a time like that. Because you're as bound as sure as if he had you tied with rope from head to toe like a mummy. You're not able to function as a child of God. Therefore, let's take a look at what you're what you can do legally as a Christian. I'm going to use these legal terms so that you I want to keep this away from the physical as far as binding and keep it spiritual and therefore let me allow me to use legal terminology. What you are allowed as a Christian to do but probably the most important thing what he expects you to do. I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16 if you would please. I don't want you to forget verse 12 in that 16th chapter. Verse 12, and allow me to digress just a moment yet to set the foundation, if I may, for what we're going to be going into. Jesus had fed the multitudes on a couple of occasions, and they gathered up the fragments of the bread. And he said, anytime you've got a multitude gathered together and you've got a lot of fragments, beware. They thought he was scolding them because they had brought no bread. But you will read in that 12th verse, I believe it is. Somebody correct me if I'm not uh, accurate. He said, beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That is to say, the Kenites in the Hebrew tongue. Beware that doctrine. And then he comes to that beautiful place where he picks Peter. Simon Bar-Jonah. Let's pick it up, if we may, in verse 17 of that 16th chapter of Matthew. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. What is Bar-Jonah? Simon in the Hebrew tongue means hearing. That means get your ears open. What does Bar-Jonah mean? It means the son of Jonah. What does Jonah mean in the Hebrew tongue? The dove. Peace, understanding, but most of all, Holy Spirit. For it was as the dove that the Holy Spirit came down at the moment Christ uh, was baptized. So he didn't call him Peter because he was the one that Christ would use. Though he would deny him thrice uh, on the night of the crucifixion, he would use this one man in flesh to establish the church through 120 people. That's only a congregation about the size of our local congregation. About 120 people. And he called him by this name because it was to signify those that were here, Simon, hearing, would have see the Son as well as the Holy Spirit that they would rest upon them. Now let's get the ramifications. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. <clears throat> it wasn't your little old mind personally that, that caused you to say, I am Messiah, Yeshua. But my Father which is in heaven. Almighty God gave you that revelation. Verse 18. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, now, in the Greek, heta means uh, it's a movable rock. It is not the rock that is called Christ or God, which is in the Greek an immovable rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what does that tell you? That if you've got the outline of the correct church, which is not a building, but the many-membered body of Christ that has the truth, all around the world, we have the victory and the gates of hell cannot bother you. Satan cannot bind you. You will become mature enough in Christianity that you'll say, get off my back and get gone. And you will vivaciously come alive and begin to serve Christ and your fellow man without burden or hardship. Verse 19. 
listen closely, sharpen up for me. And I will give. What did that say? Jesus speaking, give unto thee the keys. What is he going to give you? The keys, that that opens, no man can close. A way in. Your own key. Your own way. Your own access of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, whoever you seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven or bound in heaven. If you put that retainer fee upon them, again, legal terminology, I will honor it in heaven. That's a pretty heavy trip, friend. Did, did you hear what he said? He said, I'm going to give you a key that allows you to open heaven for people. I'm going to allow you that if you bind them here in Christ, now understand, in truth, if you seal in their forehead, to seal is to set a seal upon one's mind or any object whereby it cannot be um, abused or anything without it being very obvious that it has been abused. The king's seal, the signet of his ring with the wax. If you open that letter, the wax is torn. It's obvious. But we're talking about seals that cannot be broken, for it is impossible to go back. The flesh will drag you down, but your mind is not going back. But he gives you the ability. He said, hey, even though you're in the flesh... I will honor what you seal. I will honor what you bind. Not only will it be bound on earth, but you've got the key to heaven. It's bound there also. Now, if you take that thought in, well, let's, let's, go, let's go just a little bit further. What thou bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, if you set someone free from Satan's grasp, they'll be free from him here also. Now, that's only common sense if you'll stop and think about it for a moment. We have a twofold captivity, in a sense. No one, we Americans particularly, don't too much like that word captivity. But to be held captive by Christ is what we all desire. But you can also be held captive by Satan. He's got a lot of good bargains for you, friend. Many of his little bargains go something like this. I don't think they're being fair to me. I don't think the rest of the family is really showing the love for me that they should. I, I think they're picking on me. As a matter of fact, now that I think about it, I know. I know they're picking on me. Oh, God, if they would just love me. And they really build themselves up a case then, all right, using legal terminology, and it becomes a reality to them because they're going to become so obnoxious with that poor baby me stuff until none of the rest of the family will be able to put up with them. Satan has it made then. He's, he's made his point. He's standing over laughing, and your family is falling apart like a stack of dominoes. Stupid Christians, we are, that we allow him to work us through our own minds because it's poor me. You know, it would be, we'd really be quite different, but it's poor me. I agree with him. They're really picking on me. <laughs> We're so soft, so soft in this world age. Well, I'm digressing again. Did anybody need that? I really didn't have any use for going into that, and it kind of takes away from from what I wanted to the point. We were, we were down in some serious things here. What you seal on earth is sealed in heaven. Do you understand the ramifications of that? That is quite a charge and a responsibility placed upon the church. And it's just the same as when we teach here 24 hours a day. I don't care whether you live in the local con congregation or you that are miles and miles away. When you are a part and participate your name is on that seal as the king's ring, the same as mine is, or any a camera person or that technician that's 
that's broadcasting while we're even sitting here teaching in this room. If someone has reached this moment with whatever is being taught there, you're a part of it. And that goes to your credit. If they're sealed on earth, I will honor it in heaven, for I have given you the key. That's beautiful, beloved. That shows his love. Now, this is going to take some qualification so that we don't become overburdened now in the other direction with the seriousness of the charge. And it is a charge. But yet it's such a beautiful thought that you, you, through the Word of God, has a key that can open minds and insert a soul in heaven. What a beautiful thought. What a responsibility. But you that have that deeper truth that know to seal in that mind, you would even know and recognize the fact that Revelation chapter 7 states to the four winds, the angels that control the four winds, wait, uh, don't let the end come until we seal in the minds those uh, that are supposed to receive the seal of the living God, which is to say the truth of His Word in their minds. Uh, and then it takes on a new meaning to you. He gave you the key. The sealing must be for the end is soon. We talk about growth and it amazes and yet at the same time it's time. It is time. But I want you to see your responsibility in this. I give you the key to heaven. Boy, that's trust to give to mortal man. Because I want you to see what happened to Peter, this one he's talking to, just following this. Just, I mean, the words are, those beautiful words are hardly out of his mouth. And listen, verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus uh, the Christ, that he was Messiah, Yeshua. Don't tell anyone. It's not time. 21, for from that time forth, because began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. He began to tell them that he would be crucified. In other words, that key had a price attached to it, friend. He paid it. Then Peter, this is that Barjona, that son of the beautiful dove, the Holy Spirit, we're talking about here. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Friends, the Old Testament is full of the crucifixion of how it must come to pass, that beautiful 22nd Psalm that even gives you God's words, Jesus' words, rather, on the cross, Ela, Ela, Lama, Shabbatene. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? quoting it verse by verse. Peter knew it. But he still made a dumb statement like that. A very dumb statement. But do you know what brought it about? His love for the Savior. Love can cause us to be dumb. But it's what the flesh wanted. Peter didn't want to be left alone, didn't even want the thoughts of being left alone. And yet he should have known he, we, are, we are never alone, whether he's here or there. But he turned, and he said unto Peter, This man he has just called Barjona, Get thee behind me, Satan! Hey, do you take charge like that, friend, in your family or in your life? Hmm? Are you a can-do, take-charge type person? Get behind thee, Satan! Satan had Peter bound. Christ just loosed him. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Yet think, he gave flesh man the key to heaven. What you will seal on earth, I will honor it in heaven. What, what an, a, a burden. A beautiful burden, yes. Though he would have to correct this one, 
so soon after making the statement, the charge still remained. Whatever you bind or seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven. That means if you make it good, it will stay good. If you bring them to me, now I want you to listen to my words before you start getting the big head now, or puffed up with the responsibility God has placed upon you, okay? When you bring them to me, I will honor them. He didn't, I didn't say he would honor us necessarily. He would honor the binding. Turn with me to the 18th chapter of the same book, 18. I don't think we're going to go into too much of this. Christ is telling you in this particular chapter to set the course. If two of you have an argument, how you should settle it, okay? And let's don't go into that much basics. Let's just skip to the 18th verse and pick up the thought. After the procedure, the legal method that you would go through as a Christian to settle a problem with a brother or a neighbor. And let's pick it up in 18. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever you shall bi- ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Why? Because of that key that you possess. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth, shall be loosed in heaven. If you free someone from Satan's grasp or any bad habit or some might say sin or whatever, it's going to be loosed or they're going to be forgiven for it here as well. I want you to get to the bottom of this now, though. Verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, It shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, what's the subject? We're not talking about material things. The subject has been mending broken hearts, disputes, okay? A lot of people turn this around and have with the so-called prosperity ministries and have people dreaming golden Cadillacs instead of a decent life, okay? A good soul is far better off than riches of this world, though there's nothing to be ashamed of God's blessings, if you understand what I'm saying. What I'm saying is get your mind right back down where in the next verse. For where two or three are gathered together in my name. Now, you can't con God. They're gathered not for their own sake, not for their own purpose, Or they don't have a gathering. You understand where I'm coming from? A lot of people misinterpret this. Uh, They have two or three together and and in their minds are under Christ's name for devious reasons. We're going to make false gain. I'm talking about people that don't understand the word. This doesn't apply to them. They lost the battle before they ever got started. Where two or three are gathered in my name, that means Christ and he is the word. The word must be there. There am I in the midst of them. Now think about that a moment. Everything you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And when you bind someone, how many of you do there... How how many does this require to be present? And I'm not talking about intercessory prayer. Don't, Don't go to using terminologies upon me. You get with it. If you are sealing someone, that means opening God's truth to the point that they are sealed in the Word. How many of you are present? There are two. Then what does that mean? Christ is there also. So who does the binding? It wasn't you at all. It was the Lord. He is not in heaven. He is where He would be where two or more of you are gathered together and a sealing takes place. He's there. He's quite capable of handling the sealing, even though we get part of the credit of so many-membered body, if you're concerned with credit, okay? So sometimes when we think, oh, the awesome responsibility of being a Christian, 
Here I have to make my mind up whether we're going to accept. Now that I have the key, this one into heaven, it's not your problem, friend. All you can do is take the key, open the little mine, put in the seed, and if the two of you are agreed, which means he's not going to be agreed with you until he sees this, the truth, all right, the, the necessity, which is the love of the Lord and the Word, Christ is not going to join the two of you until that is de facto. In other words, but it has taken place then Jesus is present. He does the sealing and naturally it's honored in heaven for wherever he is, is heaven. An oversimplification perhaps, but true. So how precious it is, how precious it is that he still gives you, the, he trusts you with the key. The, I want you to grasp it, the key to heaven. Not the key to some little old house, uh, not the key to some little society, but the key to heaven and how precious it is. That is why it is written in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, or 8, 9, 10, that you have the key that openeth and no man can shut us, and shutteth and no man can openeth. It's binding and loosing through the word of the living God, how precious it is, especially at this time when the sealing is ever, ever so important. Where those two are, then so there we find him. Real quickly, I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 13. You all know that in biblical numerics, the number 18 is bondage or binding. In biblical numerics, this woman had been under a curse for 18 years. It was a curse of sickness. And Jesus states in the 16th verse of Luke 13, he, he had healed. He was he was about to heal this woman, and the Pharisees were coming down. Hey, you don't do that kind of thing on Sunday, all right, or on the Sabbath rather. 16. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound? Hey, friend, you don't think he can do it? He had done this to her for 18 long years. And again, 18 in biblical numerics means bound. It means bondage. Lo, these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? You don't think it would be right for us to do away with Satan. What I want you to see is that you can be taken into two kinds of bondage if you're not careful. You can be sealed into Satan's society and the quickest little trip of deception is to feel sorry for yourself. Poor me. That's only one, my dear friend, of his bargains. He, he drives many others. As you know, we have a tape titled Satan's Bargain. He has many of them for the waiting, sleeping Christian, those that are not alert to his word. Okay, turn. let's go to the... We're in Luke. Let's turn right on to the Gospel of John. You all know John 3.16. We're not going there. Okay? But we are going to John chapter 3. We're going to pick it up. At verse 27, you know what's happening here. John the Baptist was baptizing a wa with a water baptism. And they were some asking, by what authority? Or are you the Messiah? Or why is this great move taking place? And John begins to answer them in verse 27, John chapter 3. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. That's a good statement. Ye, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him. In other words, what John is telling you, I can hear the Lord now. He talks with me. 
I'm aware, rejoiceth greatly because the bridegroom's voice, that's the husband's voice, this my joy therefore is fulfilled. That's why I was sent, is what John says. He must increase, but I must decrease. 31. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. Verse 33, He that hath received his te testimony hath set to his seal, you underline it, seal that God is true. He never lies, dear one. It is all on schedule. It is all on time. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure, that's to say full measure, if you would, unto him. 35. The Father loveth the Son. We're talking about Yeshua here. Loveth the Son, and hath given all things unto his hand. He has turned it totally over to him. Therefore, when Jesus says, I have given you a key, it was totally his right and power to do that, because the Father had given him that authority. The seal was set upon it. It was binding. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Unfortunately, shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Unfortunately, sometimes when the wrath of God abides on one that falls, that slips, that steps to one side, do you think Satan's going to have mercy on you because you are in danger of the wrath of God? Uh-uh. He's one of these that likes to pick up the strays, you know, the weak. Pick them off at the back of the pack, all right? Anytime you're weak and down and out, you, you're a ready kill for him. So bear that thought in mind. But the seal that God's Word is true is probably the most valuable seal that you can ever possess. You must believe that and you must understand it. If you're not a believer, and that's a term that probably is overused, uh, a believer in what? A believer in the Word. Well, what does that mean? Friend, that means every bit of it. And if you don't know the Word, you don't know whether you're a believer or not. You're playing Christian. You're a lazy Christian. You must study all the Word. Certain parts are obsolete, such as blood ordinances, rituals, etc., but it doesn't hurt to be familiar even with them. Turn on, turn on with me while we're here in John to chapter 6. Chapter 6, we're going to read two verses here. How much time are we into this? Um, 20 minutes? 30 minutes, okay. All right, uh, verse 26 of the sixth chapter of St. John. We're not, going to, we're not going to belabor this much further, but I just want you to be familiar with it. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me not because ye saw the miracles, this is the multitudes that followed him, okay, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. In other words, the only reason you're seeking me is I fed you yesterday and your old gut is crying out a little bit. The only thing you want to do is eat again. You know, Christ could read minds. He knew what they were thinking. What's in it for me, Charlie's, okay? Verse 27, and his advice, Labor not for the meat which perisheth. You know, that's, that's the bread on your table, you know, that you ask the Lord to bless every time you sit down, breakfast, noon, and supper, if you're getting three squares. That, that's perishable. If you don't believe it, leave it sit there for three or four days. That'll make a believer out of you. Don't worry about that sort of meat, all right? 
But for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, for the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. In other words, when two of you agree in the Word, and the Son is there, the Son is the seal. You might say, well, what is God trying to tell us here? It's written throughout the Old Testament time and time and time again as an example for we slow ones that need to see a sign. Show us what you mean. All right? Who, first of all, does the sealing? Well, in the old days, in the Old Testament, there was only one seal that better show up. And that's true. There was only one seal, and friend, he slept with it. That's the king man wanted, right? It was his ring, the signet. That was the only seal there was. Who put it on? The king. The little hot wax was melted, and the little signet went into it. And friend, to have that ring was just as good as being king, more or less. Because everyone trusted that. Then why am I dragging out these scriptures that show that Christ has the seal? Because he's the king. All right? He is the king. And if it isn't his seal that has you sealed, then, then you've already fallen off and been deceived by the deception of the traditions of men rather than the word of God uh, and are bearing a false seal. What is the false seal in your forehead? If you've never read Revelation 13, verse 18, I couldn't help you. That's the mark of the beast. Quite simply, overused, overworked, and overplayed. And as I said, these are simple basics, and yet at the same time, there is a deep truth within this in the legal, spiritual sense that I want you to be sure and grasp. For a very special reason, turn with me to Ephesians. In closing, do you remember Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where it says, I chose you before the foundations of this earth? What was he talking about? In the Greek, it states the kebel, which is to say the overthrow, Satan's first rebellion at his overthrow. And it continues on in verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Christ Jesus to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Whose will? Yours? Nope. God's. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The first fruits, that is to say. Verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to to the riches of his grace. Verse 8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom. How much of it have you claimed, friend? You hold it in your hand. It's there for the taking. How much have you partaken of? The meat is there. If you're starved and, and you don't understand the word, it's your own fault. Don't blame someone else. Well, I could blame the pastors. No, the word is made easy for everyone, for it is translated into our language. Of course you have men and women that are gifted with teaching. That even is no excuse if you don't have access to a good teacher and an understanding of the original languages because you still have the Word. Having made known unto us the mystery of His will. Do you know what that mystery is? That's the in-depth truth of God's Word, the mystery that is hidden to most people according to his good pleasure which he hath proposed in himself. Skip to verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, this is in Christ, after that ye heard the word of truth, that's the good news, the gospel, which means good news, of your salvation, to whom also, after that ye believed, there's a qualification, first you've got to believe it, well, I don't know if I want to believe about Noah. Then, then just chunk the whole thing, friend. 
If you haven't got faith in God's Word with Noah being explained uh, to you from the manuscripts, then you don't believe any of it. There's no such thing as believing a little bit. There's no such thing as having a little bit of faith in belief. You either believe or you don't. What am I saying? You either believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God or, friend, you don't. And that divides the men from the boys right quick like. You're playing otherwise. After that ye believed, that being the qualifier, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. You want to put up a little earnest money, friend? You want to put up a little binder? Then believe. But don't let it just be words. Believe with all your heart, mind, and soul. Jesus, who died, was born of a virgin birth. Our Heavenly Father was His Father. And He is our Savior. That is your earnest money. Again, forgive me for using legal terminology, but it's easier to understand when explained in that using that method. Earnest for of our inheritance. Take in that word. Do you know what it means? It means you're an heir. Your father owns all things, and you become an heir. Why couldn't he give you a key to the kingdom? It's yours. You're a citizen. unto the redemption of the purchased. Do you know what something that is purchased you were? Well, I didn't know I cost God anything. He cost His Son His life because of your sin. My sin. There would have been no need for it except for you, for me, and a lot of other people. Our sin. But praise God, he purchased because he paid the price. Uh, the purchased, pos- the purchased, uh, we continue. Let me read this 14th verse again. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore, I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Do you realize that Paul is still teaching you? He just did. It's still, even today, as I know he's there in paradise, as these scriptures are read in the simplicity in which he put them forth, of the sealing, that Paul enjoys the fact that God gave Peter that key and all those that would be believed that would become a part would likewise have a copy of that key. A key to get in. A key to get into what? Heaven? Nope, nope, nope. That's not it. A key to bind and a key to loose. A signet, which is to say a seal that is honored in heaven. Because wherever you use that seal, the king will be present, as we learned. Jesus, that is to say, where two of you gather and agree for the sealing, he will seal. Naturally, then, he honors. And as we look in this generation, this generation that now lives through this parable of the fig tree, when... We have the privilege and God has seen fit to give us a platform whereby we can join together wherever you are in studying His Word. But not only... You think it is not that important that you and I be able to study together, though it is, for you're sealed. But it's to seal and bind those things on earth that yet have need to be sealed whereby the second advent transpires. It's a great responsibility that he places upon you, but a wonderful responsibility. You never have to worry or fear, for he he makes the decision. And we plant the seeds. So, with the king's signet, see that you use it wisely or request that he use it wisely. 
But most of all, study His Word and believe. For without the Word and the truth to plant seeds, you're not going to have anybody to seal anyway. Work at it, study, and give thanks for His Word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the Word. We thank You, Father, for Your truth. We thank You for the mysteries that are within the Word. Give us the knowledge and the wisdom to dig into them, to meditate upon them, to absorb them, to understand. May we be worthy servants. And, Father, we would ask that You look out for Christendom throughout this nation and the world this day. Strengthen the hearts of Christians and let them know that it is Thee, dear Jesus, that is our example, not anyone.